Yep, good morning again. So we're going to take a look this morning at the comprehensive local needs assessment and what you'll need to do um, to write that section of your Perkins application for fiscal year 23. So our agenda, we're going to review briefly the CLNA requirements. By now you probably can all say them in your sleep. Hopefully you're not all dreaming about them. I only do that about once a week. Hopefully you're not having that experience. Um, we'll take a look at what you will need to include in GMS and I'll give you a sneak peek of what the application will look like for fiscal year 23. We'll talk about what you will need to upload versus what you will need to write. And we'll review the CLNA checklist. And if you've been working with the CLNA checklist, you'll find that there are no surprises, I hope, in the application. We built the application and the checklist hand in hand um, so that there shouldn't be any big surprises there, but we'll walk through it all and you'll have a chance to ask questions about anything you're not sure about. I now have available for you statewide fiscal year 21 data that I shared by email last night. Um, for those of you who invited guests, if you want to forward that email with that um, data to them, you are welcome to do so. That data is all um, public information and can be distributed in any way you choose. So um we're going to talk about how you're going to about center specific fiscal year 21 data we're going to talk a little bit about improvement plans and next steps so that's the plan for this morning and just as a reminder the clna does have six required components student performance and perkins accountability data disaggregated by race gender and special population categories the alignment of CTE programs to labor market economic priorities and needs, um, program size, scope, and quality, progress toward the implementation of programs of study, faculty and staff recruitment, retention, and professional development, lowering, lowering barriers to access, improving equity, and ensuring the success of students who are in categories deemed as special populations by Perkins. And just as a reminder, our recommended timeline was that all institutions complete their all sections of the CLNA by April 1st. But if you need more time and you can do it by May 6th, you're still in really good shape. Um, and if you needed another week after that, I think that would be OK. But you really need to have your CLNA done no later than May 15th. And we're really strongly encouraging May 6th. So. The Agency of Education will provide data to help you know if your center has to, it will tell you if you have to submit an improvement plan. Our data should be available to you to inform that by April 1st. So those of you who were at the VACTED meeting yesterday heard me say that we have a wonderful new data coordinator and he has completed all of our statewide data that we needed to report to the US Department of Education. And from that, he is now working on center specific data reports. And um, so he will have those and as they become available, I will share them with you. Based on our discussion of statewide data today and your CLNA work to date, hopefully you'll have an idea before you get that data of where your center may need to dedicate resources, because if you have to write an improvement plan, you have to dedicate resources to that improvement plan. So um, we'll come back to what you have to dedicate and why toward the end of the session this morning. I want to start by now, right now, by giving you a sneak peek of the fiscal year 23 application. And to do that, I have to stop sharing my screen and then start sharing it again. So just a sec here. getting to the right place. Are you seeing something that looks like GMS? And I can't see you, so somebody's going to have to say yes. Yes. Perfect. OK, so this is what the CLNA section will look like. And we're going to walk. You don't have to take notes or anything right now. It's all in slides. The slides are going to be shared with you there. So just this is just to get a ballpark idea of what it looks like. And then we're going to walk through each thing you have to do. 
So as you'll see, new this year is instead of having to write portions, you'll be up, able to upload work you've already done so that you won't have to write it again. And we'll have it for monitoring, so you won't have to worry about pulling it together if your center is selected for monitoring. It will all already be there. It will streamline a lot of processes for us. So there are things that you're going to upload, like your documentation of who contributed to your CLNA. You'll just fill that in as you go along, and you won't have to write anything. You'll just upload it. Then there'll be places where you do write um, in the do write in the um, boxes provided information as well. So you'll list your committee, CLA committee members, for example, here with their titles and roles. And then when, as we scroll down, you'll see again a combination of uploading files and then writing answers. And we're going to talk about each of this in more detail as we go along, but that's really the format. So you're just going to have some boxes to fill in and some things to upload. And what I want to stress before we get into the specifics is we've designed it to mean that you don't have to write as much, right? So while there are boxes that you have to fill in, for most of those boxes, one to two paragraphs is plenty of information. Some boxes may need a sentence. Some boxes may need more, but it does not have to be lengthy writing. It just has to answer the question asked. And we broke the questions down, we hope, into manageable pieces so that you can answer them without having to write a huge long narrative like you did before. So that's what it's going to look like. Um, I'm going to go back and just show you the rest of the application tabs. So the overview we've updated, but it's just to be current information. Contact information has stayed the same. New this year are required questions. We learned through lots of federal training that there are some questions that every application has to have. We put them all on one tab so that if we are monitored, let's say when we're monitored by US Department of Education and they want proof that everyone did the required questions, they can just look at this one tab and all the applications. We have grant writing workshops in April and May. We will give you language to get you started on writing those required questions. Don't stress about those. We're going to help you know what to put there. You'll do an updated version of your four year plan. And apparently I've lost my session. That's not helpful. And Barry, you get it. Barry's always where they build the test application. I think it's because alphabetically you're at the beginning of the alphabet. So I won't click on all of these other things because it seems like that's where I got into trouble before, but you'll update your four year plan. It's very brief. You'll um, write an improvement plan if you need to. It's very brief. Current year projects, current year budget will be very similar to what you've seen before. The only thing that's changed in current year projects is one tiny button you may have to click on and we'll explain that in those April and May sessions. So basically the biggest changes are in the CLNA, the required questions and the improvement plan and we're going to help you with all of that. So again, if you come to those April and May workshops or where we're going to work on the application, we're going to give you the language where you don't to make sure you're on the right track to what you have to write. So don't stress about it. I'm going to stop sharing this screen. Ruth, can I just ask a question? Absolutely. There's a new tab that said business manager. That is because as of. And I'm pretty sure about this, Jason, and I will double check to make sure. But as of this fiscal year, if you have an equipment in a federal grant, your business manager needs to complete additional information and it has to go through a different level of review because we were not in compliance with. Full, we were not fully in compliance with the level of equipment review required for use of federal money, so this is designed to make sure we do that. So that's something that your business manager would complete is my understanding if. Um, if you include equipment in your Perkins grant. And can the district grant manager do that or does it have to be the business manager? I don't know, Jason. Um, I will find out. Thank you. 
Uh, Ruth, that's that's a great question because we currently don't have one. I've got a financial assistant and I've got a consultant, so I need to know who would serve in that capacity. That's All right. Me. And the other thing, I so I'll find out more about that. I don't know the answers to that. Business manager, what they put. Yeah. I'm making notes here. I will find out for you. Thanks. Is that do, do the business managers always have access to GMS? Yes. Yes. Okay. And for so basically, if you had equipment in a federal grant and the grant was approved before July 1st of 2021, you haven't had to deal with this. If you put equipment into a federal grant after July 1st, 2021, or amended Perkins to include equipment, you've had to do this and it's very easy process on our end. I hope it's easy on your end. The business manager has access, puts in some information and we approve it. For us, it's really, if you've put it in your application, it's an easy approval process, but basically we have to make sure that you haven't changed what you're asking for and that you're, that it aligns to a Perkins related requirement. So, um, but for other federal grants where there's more flexibility, it's a much bigger accountability measure for Perkins. We have a lot of the protections already built into the application process. And I see that Leanne has her hand raised. Good morning. Um, you mentioned that there needed to be an updated version of the four year plan. So is it an expectation that we use parts of the four year plan that we had in our last Perkins? You get to choose and we'll talk about that at the April session. OK, and one more question. Um, you recommended that the CLNA be due April 1st, no later than May 6th, but all the way up to May 15th, if possible. Um, and then we're having um, writing workshops or grant writing workshops in April and May. Yes. So the idea is that we're going to use the CLNA information um, in a workshop style to, um, to actually write it. So you're going to you're that you're going to write the CL. The, I, have, I haven't figured out the schedule yet for each of those workshops. One of those workshops will really be focused on the four year plan and the required questions. So probably yes, the first one probably will have a chance for us to walk through other things, including the CLNA to answer questions and to give you some pointers on what to write and not write. And there'll be some time dedicated, I hope, to letting you work on things so that you can ask questions as you go along. I think we'll set it up in a situation where we can have you have some breakout rooms so that if you're looking to collaborate with people on not knowing what you need to do, we can have a time for that. I haven't designed it yet, but we will design it. And if there are things that would be helpful to you, let me know because I'll start designing those about the well in about two weeks. So as you start to think through this, if there are things that would be helpful, please share and I'll build it into the plan. Will do. My Thanks goal for the workshops for those of you who were here two years ago. It was painful for all of us because Perkins 5 was new. You were asked to write an application. We were getting feedback from Washington as you were writing the application about various things. And so there were multiple drafts that people had to write. My goal is that we do this so that it's one draft with maybe minor revisions, but no significant revisions, right? So that's the goal of those workshops. Dana. Hi, Ruth. Um, the uh, the question that I have, and I, I think I know the answer, but I just want to get verification. Um, uh, I had mentioned that uh, we're doing our, our school board review in two sessions, uh, one in April, one in May. Uh, our May session is May 14th. It's the day before the um, the final submission would be uh, due. Is is there a problem with that? Or is no, that I think it was okay? your. I think Dana, you'd shared that with me, which is why I said it, it, May fifteenth. You know, I think you want to make sure that your boards have met by May fifteenth, so you're not then finding out okay. after May fifteenth that they have a totally different track they want you to go on, right? Right. Okay. You don't want that to happen. The good thing though is then again. If you have everything by May 15th, you can finish writing your application either by the original deadline or the extended deadline. So you're still right. in good shape. OK, I just need I, I thought that was going to be the answer, but I just needed to make sure. Well, and it reminds me of why I was thinking about May 15th, because I think a couple of you have shared that you do have either regional advisory boards or school board meetings where you're going to have the last levels of review. And, and I don't want you to feel that that's a problem. I want you to take the time and to do that well. It will be OK. Great. Yeah, I'm you. very concerned if you're 
let's put it this way. If your center is working on this now and it has been working on it and you're feeling like you're it's still a big job, but you're pulling it all together, you're fine. You that's right. perfectly OK. If you're at this session and you're saying, oh, I have to start working on my CLNA this week. I'm concerned and we should talk separately. OK, Nope, I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> I know mm -hmm. that most centers are not there, so um, that's a good thing. Uh, mm -hmm. So we've had our sneak peek of the application and now we're going to walk through what you need to do. And again, if you've been working from the CLNA checklist, I hope you won't see any surprises here. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to have the document of your CLNA contributors that was sent in January and you're going to fill it out and you're just going to open it and you're uploading it into GMS. Um, hold on one sec. OK. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to. Ruth, who's supposed to be on that CLNA contributors list? So that document Tracy tells you. So if you open okay. the CLNA contributors list, it has categories for the law is very specific on who has to be included. So there's a place to put teachers. There's a place to put other school staff. There's a place to put students. You know, there Perfect. are various places. Thank you. And, and when it comes to students, your student surveys can count. You can put X number of students surveyed, right? So it you don't have to list every student name. You can do it by we administered surveys to, you know, 150 students enrolled in the CTE Center and received X number of responses. We administered surveys to X number of high school students not enrolled in the CTE Center and got X number of responses. And then if you have focus groups or other ways for students to contribute or parents to contribute, you can do that. Otherwise, you can use you can just include the survey information and the numbers surveyed. Great question, Tracy. Your CLNA committee, you're going to have your committee members names, titles, roles in the box. Remember, you need to have at least three members on your CLNA committee. You can have more if you want to. The whole purpose here is what Perkins is seeking to prevent is from one person doing all the work and making all the analysis in a way that might prevent seeing a full picture or addressing things that are uncomfortable, right? Because Perkins is all about continuous improvement. And Perkins, again, is not about individuals, whether they be students or staff, and, and it's about systems and change to better student outcomes. So it's about how do we look at our systems and processes to create effective, to strengthen our strengths and and to address our challenges. So so really Perkins is really focused on that isn't a one person job and many people need to contribute and more than one set of eyes needs to review at various places and various points of and of time. So Ruth, can next, I just, could yes, I Yes. So absolutely. you mentioned that students um, surveys count do other surveys count in other areas like that? Yes, you can absolutely include survey information in any area of participants where you can't just rely on. So let's think about it in categories. You can rely on surveys for your students and your parent participation and for some community member participation. You cannot rely just on surveys for teacher and staff participation. You can include the survey data, but you also have to include that the teachers and the staff have directly worked on the CLNA process. And um, let's see, uh, for your regional advisory board and your governance board input, it can't be just through surveys. It has to be through discussion. Ruth, just following up on that, um, when it says details of participation, can we just, how detailed do you want us to get? Is it just the section that they reviewed on that date and time or what level of detail you're looking for? That's a great question. I think what I here's I'm going to use a few examples, right? And and I don't know, but for example, for the teacher participation, for your teachers who've been there more than a year or two, they should have been actively involved in completing their program size, scope, and quality document, right? So you would put program size, scope, and quality, and you could put a timeline for that work. For teachers who are new, it may be a different level of participation, right? So it could be how they were involved. It could be a list. So it could be, you know, 
all faculty and staff attended faculty meetings or attended um, an in-service day or whatever where this was worked on, you would count that, but you would also then put in each individual's work and how they contributed. Because one of the things is important is that teachers are reviewing their programs. Okay. For other areas, it can be less detailed. So I'd say you want a little more detail for your faculty and staff, and you can be broader about some of the other categories, but you want enough so that if somebody from Washington looks, they'll know that there was depth at the appropriate level. So student surveys are great, and you don't have to say a lot more, though if you have different student input included. For community members, I would say, you know, the surveys you use, plus any other meetings where people attended, any other discussions that were held, just something that captures what you did. And if you're not sure, send us an example and we'll look at it for you and tell you if you're on the right track. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We're all doing this for the first time. I wish I had a model to tell you what perfect looks like, right? And perfect's going to look different for each center. So it's not like there's one size fits all. What it what I think we're most looking for and Washington's most looking for from us is that your efforts met the intent of the law and were genuine. That doesn't mean that there are times when you do your best and somebody doesn't give you what you need. That happens. But what did you do to try to get the full participation expected? Did anybody else have a question? I wasn't sure if I saw another hand. Sorry, just. I'd assume on all those upload links in GMS, we can upload multiple documents that that works. You're going to upload only one document. You can scan it into one PDF and upload one PDF. Got it. Which is a great point. Um, so. For your accountability measures. For and this just is exactly walking through what the application re requires. You're going to. Compile the answers to the questions on slide 28 of the CLNA October session and upload that into GMS. And again, that's the same information you're told to do um, on your checklist. So it may not say upload into GMS, but it's going to say compile these answers. You're going to answer a series of questions. My recommendation to you is that you write your app, you take these questions and you put them into a Word document and you write your answers there and you copy and paste them into GMS because GMS can time out on you. And it's no so frustrating if you're writing something beautiful and you have a student issue or a staff issue and you get called away and it times out because it doesn't save your work. So my best advice is to write it in a document where you have it all written out and you only have to copy and paste into GMS so you do not have that frustration. I say this from personal experience. The US Department of Education reporting system does the same thing and it timed out on me three times this week and it doesn't let you save once it tells you you have a five minute warning, which was really annoying. So don't put yourself into that level of stress. If possible, write it in some place else, save it and then just be ready to copy and paste. So I'm giving you all the questions so that as you're going along, you can write the answer to that particular question and just have it ready to upload when you're ready. If you don't have time to do that, we'll also help you with that at those sessions in April and May. So then the questions you have to answer, which Perkins 5 account and accountability measures are areas of, st of strength for your institution and how do you know this? So you're going to know it based on percentages. You're going to know it based on things your center is really good at, and you're going to use data to inform that. And you can be brief here. So, you know, this is again where we're really good at graduation rate and we're really good at students earning post-secondary credits or we're really good at students earning these five things. These are, you know, just the areas where your center is right where it needs to be or ahead of the curve. What institutional data is disaggregated when your data is disaggregated by gender, race and special population categories? What strengths and needs emerge? And you'll have a better sense of what I'm talking about when we look at the statewide data, because what the statewide data shows, for example, for Vermont, is there are areas where we are great 
until you look at the disaggregated data. And then we have areas where it's like, oh, we have certain students who are not serving as well as others. What do we do about that? That's what Perkins is asking us to do. That's where we will be sharing more data with you by April 1st that will help you with writing that answer to that question. Um, in reviewing program level data overall and disaggregated by gender, race, and special population categories, what strengths and needs emerge? And again, we'll look more at that. Oh, I sorry, that's in there twice. There's a different. Obviously, I'll go back and fix that. Something got in there twice, something's missing, but we'll make sure the version we send out to you has the right question D. So. Slide nine, question D. And then, Ruth. yep. Ruth, can I just ask a question about this? So, so I know we have so many nice tables to guide us through size, scope, and quality and program analysis. So this one, are we looking at that um, data that you give us and drawing from data that we've uncovered in the size, scope, and quality and making something? I'm trying to picture what this looks like because we need to present this to the RAB and the governance board. So, so am I offering them some documents and then at, giving them our initial analysis and then asking them for their feedback? Yes, and Gwen, I would say for that part, when you have the April 1st data, you'll take that along with your program size, scope, and quality, and that will be, you'll put that into a into a format to share and get their feedback, right? Yeah, so I'm thinking like I have a RAB meeting next week and I want to present two sections to them. So maybe those two sections would work best together. Yes, I would mm -hmm. say they might. And when I think about it, I think, you know, like, and I think what you may want to say to them is let's talk about what we have now and understand that when we have some statewide data that's coming to us, we may want to add something into this conversation that we missed, right? Okay. And so so we don't have to upload this data into the CLNA. You have this data. We just have to provide some narrative and some analysis exactly. on the data. Okay. Exactly. And we'll focus on this at the April session. I think this, Gwen, this is making clear that it will be helpful to all of us to have some time in April to really think through what this looks like, right? And how you write it. Um, what programs will need dedicated attention or supports to improve student performance? So for example, if I look at disaggregated data, which we're gonna do later on, students in some of our programs are doing super, super well. Students in other programs may not. You'll see data that suggests that statewide we have work to do. You'll do the same level of analysis in your institution. And that's not necessary. And what I want to focus on again is that's not about students or staff. It may be about them, right? But it's also about systems. So a new teacher may not be at the same place as a seasoned teacher and where they are in their student outcomes. And so how are we helping support new teachers? Or some teacher may be resistant. How? What are we doing to help overcome the resistance? Where's the? Re, what's the resistance based in? And how do we help shift the thinking? So those are the kinds of things Perkins is asking us to do. Or it may be that it's here's what we know about our students, and this shows that we need additional resources because we have really qualified people helping them, but it's not quite enough. And what do we do about that? And we may need to put specific energy or resources into addressing that. And this will make more sense again when we look at the statewide data in a little bit. Which Perkins Ruth, five? Yep. That's Dana. Uh, really, Dana. Uh, really quickly. Um, uh, piggybacking on something uh, Gwen said in terms of presentations to uh, RABs and uh, school boards, um, the the question that uh, I'm contemplating with my uh, with my review team itself is uh, how, how much volume should we be giving them and our summary pages uh, recommended for you know a couple we're trying to do it in chunks for yep. a couple of our our sections so uh, uh i got a question from my, i think it was my board chair uh about well how many documents are we expected to review and can we have them plenty ahead of time then i said well i, I think what we're trying to do is consolidate and and provide you with a summary rather than all of the data that we've been looking at Am I wrong in that? In that, you uh, could do approach? it either way, Dana. You know, you could do a summary and ha and tell people if they want to see the documentation behind it that it's yep. available. Great. Um, you could share all of the documents with them and then just do a one-page summary of what you think you most want them to focus on. 
Yep. You could do it in a variety of ways. Okay. I think that's where your CLNA committee really comes into play. I think the goal of the committee is to take that first step at making it manageable, right? Yep. Thank you. And pointing out the key things they see and seeing if others who review it see the same things. The one thing I'd caution you against is, and it's, I think we all have this tendency either, you know, we have a different, we have different levels of comfort with sharing. We're all happy to share great data, right? When it comes to sharing less than ideal data, I think it's, Perkins requires that you do that, but I think it's important then to do it in a framework of we're sharing the data so that we can have a, a constructive right. conversation about where we need to invest time and energy to improve outcomes, not to place blame, right? right? So we don't want it to be, oh, if we just had better students, we wouldn't have this problem. Yeah, no. I don't want this to be, oh, if we stopped accepting students who are in special populations categories, we wouldn't have this problem. Actually, Perkins would say that's a violation of the law. So, <laughs> but, but what we do want to do is say, okay, now that we've looked at our data, we know that for some of our students, we need to do something different. And here's, and that's, and the benefit of this is now we know we have two years to think about what we want to try to do it to do to start showing growth and improvement in that area. So it's really a process of continuous self improvement and helping your boards think about it that way and being collaborators in improvement rather than focusing on negativity about individuals, I think will be really important. Thank you. Thank you. That said, I'm thinking of just 20 years of experience working in CTE centers. And I can think of one program in those 20 years where the data really showed me that it was a teacher issue. And that would be a that would just require me. I wouldn't you know, that would require me as an administrator to know that I had to deal with that teacher issue, right? Like that, that no matter how many other supports we put into place for that program, the teacher had a role to play at that the teacher was actively not playing, then you want to address that. But for 95% of our teachers, I think they're doing an excellent job. They just need may need additional time, supports, resources. It's not about them, it's about systems again. Thanks. And then where does your in where are the measures where your institution needs to improve? And how does your data analysis inform what you're going to do next, right? So really Perkins is supposed to focus on what does your data tell you? And based on that, how do you identify the possible root causes for what's happening? And how did you develop improvement strategies that aren't just, I'm going to use an example from a center back in 2004 or 2003 probably when I was still, before I went to Randolph, and there was one center that had an administrator whose response to everything was not to be deliberate. He would take literally everything that had ever been presented at any training he went to and say and write a plan that said, here's every resource I've ever gotten on this topic. And that was his plan for improvement. Instead of saying, I'm gonna think about what one or two strategies most apply to my center. More is not better. Throwing in everything to show that you know about the data isn't helpful. Finding what you know about the data and how that informs planning something that's not just easy or expedient, but actually could create change is what Perkins is asking for. And the thing about Perkins is they're gonna come back and ask us in two years if we got better. So we wanna use our time and energy well so that we can capture what we've improved on and then dedicated resources to the areas where we still struggle, but we don't wanna come back two years from now and have the data look exactly the same. The next section is alignment to labor market information. You will only upload information for center for programs that were designated as a maybe or a no in the charts provided in November. Um, and then your supporting documentation and analysis about what you did to say, yep, we show that this is a need in our area. And again, most, you know, I've heard from several teachers who are in that maybe or no category who felt good because their their review of the data showed that their program is needed and their outcomes are strong. And to give another example of that, I'm going to use teachers in two different culinary arts programs right now. The program that has strong student placements, 
strong students continuing on to post-secondary education, even if they aren't going to a culinary program in Vermont, if they're going to college in Vermont or going to a culinary arts program out of Vermont, that's all good data. Earning college credit or earning post-secondary credentials, that's all good. I'm concerned about the programs where none of those things are in place, right? So where students aren't earning post-secondary credits or aren't earning post-secondary credentials and also may or may not be going on to success after they leave the program. So those are the kinds of things where those are the factors that really, in addition to what the labor market looks like, is your program aligned with it in a way that lets students be successful, that sets them up for success. And we can talk more about that at any point in time, but really it's to be on the yes, to be on the maybe or no category only means that you need to show that there's a need for graduates in that area as well as the fact that your program is then aligned to what graduates need. And again, I've told your teachers it's not because the program isn't valid, it's because there hasn't been a statewide analysis of how the program contributes to the Vermont economy in a way that meets federal law requirements. And as I said to some of your teachers, ideally, we'd have the statewide resources to do that for you. We don't, so that's why it falls on centers. We just don't have the capacity um, to do all of that work, and I am sorry about that because I know it puts a burden on you and your teachers. Ruth, I, is we, oh, go ahead, Melissa, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, I just wanted to ask, I had some teachers that I met with this morning around cluster meetings, and they asked a question, I gave an answer, and I wanna make sure my answer is correct. They okay. were stating that in their cluster meeting, they were working on writing a lot of these sections together as a cluster. And I told my instructors they should not do that because it has to be specific to our center. And I, I just want to make sure that that's accurate, that there shouldn't. That is accurate. And Melissa, I have attended those cluster meetings and that's not what they're doing. So I'm wondering if it's kind of like a subcluster of the cluster kind of individually. I wonder guided. if people are getting together in other ways because okay. I've attended almost all the cluster meetings and they're very structured and they have a 10 minute survey that they fill out that has one section on the CLNA. So it's probably three minutes of the meeting. Okay. So anyway, that's what sure I've seen, one. right? And the I other part is I've answered a lot of questions me. in those cluster meetings, but they, they don't have time to have worked on those things. Okay. It's I a very structured that agenda. Let's <laughs> verify that that was accurate. Thank you. It is accurate. Thanks for verifying. Leanne, were you next? I'm not sure, but I'll go and until somebody else um, says it's their turn. You mentioned success after they leave the program. Can you help um, me understand what that means? Um, does we, yes. you were yes. sort of on the subject of culinary? Does it mean that they have to be in the culinary field? Does it have to be that twenty something dollars an hour? What defines success after leaving the program? To start with, it's going to grow over time, but our baseline starting point is goes on to college or goes into employment or goes into the military. And then we're asking you to figure out what percentage go on in a related field and what don't. But currently any successful going on counts toward Vermont's measure over time we will be asked to redefine that measure. So we have not yet had to redefine that measure. So right now, any student who goes to college, any student who gets a job counts over time that federal government's going to make us report that in new ways. We haven't had to do that yet. OK, so any job, not necessarily at that 20 something dollar an hour. Right. And or any now. job in that industry? Any job in that or industry, but also other employment, right? Because so that's where we're being asked to, I, to, to start collecting that data in a way that shows what percentage are within the industry and what aren't. And I think we already have that to a certain extent. And we'll probably have to come up with some new benchmarks for that, but that's probably going to be over the next two years. So don't stress about that now. That's where we're going to focus next year or the year after. So basically they count unless they're sitting in their parents' basement in their underwear playing video games. Yeah, we have a very high percentage. So so that's the thing, right? We're over 90% in Vermont. If I look at who yeah. goes on in something related or goes to college, we're at about 77%, which is still pretty darn impressive. Good, okay. I just wanted to make sure I get it right. <laughs> A follow up on that, Ruth. On, I'm looking at like cosmetology on the LMI document, and there is a specific question that says analyze the related. How yes. They 
So cosmetology is really important because of the licensure piece, right? Just so there's some program areas where it's clearer. You know, if your students are taking the state cosmetology exam, then what's the return on their entering the workforce, right? In that related field. I think it's the same for electrical and plumbing programs that align to the state apprenticeship program. What percentage continue on in those fields? It's a different level of review than some of our programs where students can go in lots of different, where the pathway's a little less structured, right? So culinary on the LMI document says related to, that we're supposed to analyze the related employment. Yes, anything that's in the maybe or no category, it's related. It doesn't mean that every student has to go on to that. If we're at 50%, we're probably fine. Okay. It's not 100%. It's okay. to have baseline data so that we know moving forward what our goals are. And we won't know until we have baseline data what we need to do next. But great questions. Okay. Sorry, my. Okay. You're going to summarize your findings. And then you're going to list any programs that do not identify with labor market information. So that means if you're doing this and you're finding out that really there's not a place and it's okay to look statewide and it's okay to look, you know, at neighboring states, depending on a variety of factors. But if you're finding out that there aren't jobs for those graduates or there aren't good post-secondary um, opportunities, then how are you going to redesign your program to better align with what the needs are to better align with what the post-secondary opportunities are to ensure your students are well placed after they graduate or close the program so that's still again that's by fiscal year 25 so none of this means it happens next year it means that you've got two years after this to say if we have something that doesn't show an alignment what are we doing to fix that And then you'll upload answers to your questions that were in the slides from November and summarize any key findings from the questions on the slides. And then is, are there program changes your institution will undertake or continue to explore based on your labor market analysis? So your labor market analysis might say, it could literally be, nope, we're good, we're fine, we're offering the right programs. It could be, we wanna start a new program and here's why. It could be we see that this program needs to change or phase out, and here's why. One of you sent me something today that said, how do I close a program? So I presume somebody's looking at closing a program. That's okay. Sometimes we have people who, you know, we have a program that has significantly low enrollment for multiple years. What do we do with that? Those are the kinds of things you would address and both either here or in program size, scope, and quality. So it could be that here you're addressing, oh, if I suddenly have space available in my building, then I want to start this new program and I've identified what it is so that you're prepared when money becomes available to do that. You don't have to make changes to your programs, but if your review of data says we have unmet needs or we have things that aren't meeting needs, that's where you put it. Hey Ruth, just a quick question on that. Can you also put a program on hold? Yes. And as a matter of fact, Hartford did that. Hartford had a teacher who had to leave. They couldn't find a qualified teacher for the following year. They put it on hold and they're going to restart the program. So they hired, you know, they just needed additional time to find the right teacher. I think we've had a couple centers that have done that. So they have time to revise the program curriculum, scope quality, rethink about how they how they design that program. You can put a program on hold. If you're going to put it on hold for more than two years, we need to talk. Okay, I might send you a separate email just asking a couple of questions. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. But yes, we want you to take time if that's the right thing without feeling a pressure to just fill, you know, to keep a program open if having a pause would be a better way to strengthen the program or find the right teacher. Program size, scope, and quality, you're going to up, you're going to take all those completed charts and scan them into one document and upload them. And then you're going to talk about any programs that don't meet size requirements using the questions on using the information on slide 28 of September slides. Which so you're just going to say, yep, our programs are doing fine in terms of size or this is this program really is struggling with having enough students. So all the criteria for making that analysis you will have on that slide and you'll do your your piece there. For C, 
what programs require changes to their scope and what is needed. And that will be based on the information on the slides that are listed in that question. And again, this mirrors the CLNA checklist, so I don't think there should be any surprises. Um, what programs need to improve program quality? And again, it's based on the slides. And then you'll upload your answers to questions on slur thir slide 35 of the September slides. And then the big question is, what actions will your specific actions will your institution take to address identified program size, scope, and quality issues? So that's really important because a lot of the ways you spend money tie to what you say about your program size, scope, and quality, right? So this is your chance to say, here are the things that we've identified that need investments or action. Um, and it can fall into two categories. It can fall into, we're strong in these areas, but we know we're strong in these areas because we've made these investments over time and we need to keep making them so we stay strong. And I'm going to think about an example of that is some of your math teachers that you pay for um, either with Perkins funds or with other funds. And it's like it's really important that we have this math teacher because without this math teacher, it would mean that we would not have student proficiency in math. But in addition, we have all these industry recognized credentials that have a math component and our math integrationist, our math teacher is really central to helping students earn those credentials. It could be something else. It could be it's really important that we have additional capacity. I'm thinking about Chittenden County. I know that one of the things Chittenden County wrote was it's really important for us to in ensure program quality and outcomes for our special um, for, you know, our special populations categories that we increase our English, uh, our support to English learners by hiring an additional staff person, whatever it may be. That's where your chance is to articulate that so that it's clear that the ways you're planning later to spend your money are related to one side, one, one or more portions of your CLNA. That's your chance to capture that. Um, and we again ask what programs have equipment that is scheduled for or are likely to require a replacement in the next two years and why? You put it down there and that means if we have a situation like we had recently where we gave you, you know, additional money that had been returned, we reallocated it, you have a short turnaround time to decide how to spend it. You've got already identified there are things that you could spend money on should the money become available. Or that you're going to build in if you have money after you've dedicated to the things that you're required to dedicate it to to improve your student outcomes. The same for technology and software. So by capturing it there, it means that for the next two years, if you want to spend money on any of the things you've listed there, you're in good shape. Ruth, are we being very specific or by program? I would say by program. So I think you could say, if I think about it, you know, the following programs will, these programs will have equipment needs over the next three years, two years, whatever it was. And then you can, if you're specific and you know what it is included, if you just know that it's just aging overall, say that. And when and then you would just have to go back and amend which specific piece of equipment was the one to give out. Thank you. And I know that like a couple of you have shared with me that you found that in certain programs equipment hasn't been updated in 20 or 30 years. If you you can put that in equipment in this program hasn't been updated in or half the equipment in this program or key pieces of equipment haven't been upgraded and then it's there for you. Programs of study, you're going to upload your institution's program of study analysis and answers to questions that you will have answered. And then you're going to say, you're going to summarize what are your institution's strengths in developing and implementing strong programs of study? Are there weaknesses that you need to address? And what's your two year plan if there are weaknesses for addressing them? And how does your institution's program of study analysis combined with program size, scope, and quality, quality inform your investment of time in Perkins or other funds over the next two years? So when you know what your strengths are and your challenges are, what are you going to do? And it can be with Perkins funds or without Perkins funds, but what, and it could sometimes it's just time, sometimes it's other resources, but how, what are you doing so that your data doesn't look exactly the same two years ago, two years from now as it does today? And they don't have to be long answers. Really stressing that. 
don't have to be long answers. Doug would tell you he'd prefer it if they weren't. Um, faculty and staff recruitment, retention, and professional development, you're going to upload your staff survey data. You're going to upload your answers to questions um, in the January slides. You're going to do a brief thing about faculty turnover your institution has experienced in the past two years and staff turnover. Perkins is very concerned with faculty and staff turnover. The Agency of Education is really concerned about those things. Um, and it's important, I think, as you write that to just to think about that. We certainly know when you have new teachers and new staff, but a trend where you have a significant turnover every year is going to ask you to address why and may trigger you for monitoring. So you want to, but you don't want to not be transparent about this, but you want to know that significant turnover is something that is of concern at the federal and state level. And so the biggest question will be, what are you doing to address the turnover? Sometimes it's that you have all kinds of faculty and staff who are hired at the same time and they are eligible for retirement. And the last two years have made them say, yeah, I'm going to retire. But sometimes it may be that we have new teachers who are entering the field. And if we see a pattern of new teachers all leaving after two or three years, that tells us we need to do something differently in how we support and and and, and uh, educate our new teachers. Um, I worked with a significant number of new teachers, and I would say many of them were hired by directors who are not you, but who over the past 15 years have told me that they were hired, given the keys to their classroom or shop and said and told good luck and nobody checked in with them again until like second semester. That's an easier fix than some things, right? But so but if you see a pattern of turnover, those are the things that we are questioning, like what are you doing when you see that turnover to help prevent it moving forward or to look at the root causes of why people are leaving? Ruth, it's Leanne again. I wonder, does it make sense to get um, some data from the teacher prep program around staff turnover? Would that would that show us uh, where we are as a state? That could be that very could helpful, be very Leanne. Helpful. I think that's a great idea, and I can ask for that. Um, and my question about that too is, I didn't see the turnover stuff on the initial checklist, so I'm just trying to figure out where okay, to put so that. Okay, so that's where there might be a glitch. Um, that may have been from some training that Doug and I went, or I went to, where we were told that's a really big piece of what we're supposed to collect. And if there was a disconnect there, I apologize. Staff turnover. Don't make it harder than it has to be. Right? Like for most of you. Okay, so. Erica, I'm going to use you. You have a new teacher you've hired because you had a teacher who had to leave. I know that one, right? You have a couple teachers that you've hired in the last year because you've had teachers leave for very valid reasons. You you just put in, you know, we have X number of new teachers due to a retirement, due to this, due to that, those kinds of things. Don't make it complicated. If you have half of your staff or more turning over every year, we should have a conversation. Did I miss something? OK. Perkins is really concerned about whether we're doing enough to support our new teachers. And Perkins is really concerned about if our school environments are supportive of the members of our school community, which includes students, faculty and staff. So think about framing your answers in terms of what you're doing to create an environment that keeps good people or keeps good students. Um, how are new faculty supported and mentored? Again, this can be two or three sentences, right? They go to the CTE teacher prep program. They um, have a mentor. They, you know, whatever it may be, but you don't have to make it lengthy, but what are you doing to support and mentor your new faculty? Um, what professional development priorities or needs emerge from your institution's comprehensive local needs assessment process, and how are you going to address those needs? It doesn't have to be with Perkins money. It can be with Perkins money if you want it to be. And then you're going to upload your faculty and staff list with licensure information. So you need to show that each person you have on your staff holds an appropriate license.
is that just a printout like from Alice for a teacher lookup? You could do whatever works for you, Melissa. That would be fine. And again, if you have it, you have it in different districts can fit in different ways. So, you know, your your central office may have it in a way they can share with you. You could print it out of Alice. You can do whatever works for you. You can scan it into one document and upload it. You could make a list and you could just you could just do a list that shows the teacher, the license held in the year it expires. Okay. We just need something that shows that there's a process to regularly review if people are appropriately credentialed. And and our licensing team is also Perkins requires that we don't spend money on things that where there isn't a credentialed staff person. So this again means that should we be monitored, we're well positioned to show that we have a process to check that. And we're not, for example, putting allowing you to put Perkins resources into a program that doesn't have a credentialed teacher in it. Or that we're not putting um, funding into something uh, where we know there's been a pattern of problems. So every so often there's that glitch. This just helps close that. We also, our licensing team is looking forward to doing some different work with CTE license um, endorsement revision. And this will help inform that process because they're counting on the CTE team to help identify where we have strengths and where we may have opportunities to provide technical assistance to help all of you in the work moving forward. Erica has a question. No, okay. And the last section, we're on section eight and it is the last section, progress toward, impl toward improving equity and access. You're gonna upload your student survey or focus group data here. And um, you have to upload current survey data, survey from current students, and that should say current student. And data from surveys of high school students who do not attend the CTE Center. I know some of you had trouble finding ways to get to students who don't attend your center. Some of the strategies I've heard from people are sending the surveys to students who have visited your center or expressed interest in your center in some way and haven't then followed through. Um, students who um, I've heard of one or two people who've walked next door to an attached school and asked teachers they have strong relationships with her to, uh, to give the survey to their students in their um, advisories or in other ways. Um, some have worked to ask that, you know, students in 10th grade be given an opportunity to complete the survey or students in 12th grade or 11th grade, whatever it may be. I don't think there's one right way. I think it's how do you do your best to find out from a selection of students who aren't coming to your center what their perceptions of your center are. Um, so just think about how to do that and you can get creative. There's no one right way to do this. Um, you're going to upload answers to questions on slides again, and then based on everything you've uploaded, that's where you provide for us the one or two paragraph summary about here's what we found. Here's where we're really good about equity and access. And here are the challenges we need to address. Um, and that's where student survey data may really help summarize that for you, or there may be other information that you really look at that helps summarize that for you. And then how does all of this inform where you're going to put energy and time over the next and resources over the next two years? So that's the recurring piece. If we look at the checklist, as Erica pointed out, I guess we didn't ask about faculty and staff recruitment. I mean, sub mentoring and support, but I hope you don't find any big other big differences between the checklist and what's in the application. We will have the two sessions to really um, help you answer the questions where you're struggling or to review drafts of what you've written will really make them so that they're as helpful as possible. And your feedback about where you need help as you start to work through this will help us inform how we structure those. And I have two dates set aside. If we needed a third date that was optional, we can build that in as well. 
I want you to feel like you have the support, the chance to work on this. I'm hopeful that if you come with all your materials for those um, couple of hour sessions each time, you're going to feel really like your work is manageable and you have what you need to to have your application approved. Our next thing is to take a look at statewide data. Ruth, before you do that. Yep. Uh, just a question. This goes back uh, several minutes, but uh, I thought you might be saying something within the um, uh, uh, sections. You had said copy and paste into a, a document. Do we have a template? I, I can't remember. Uh, for some reason, I think we do, but um, you do. Uh, you were given a document that has Got something it. that's very similar to all of this, and I can send it out again. Okay. Uh, for some reason, uh, on the uh, off the top of my head in the moment, uh, I'm not thinking of where I put that. If I did put it someplace, so. I will send that out today with the meeting. It will either right. be today or Monday with all of this information. It's a document that basically gave you an overview of what the application would look like in GMS. And I literally built the slides based on that document yesterday. Okay. That's what I thought. That's why I was just um, asking so that we don't have to go in, copy those things and, and, and put no, them in our No, you can work in a document I will give you and yeah, I will make sure to send it to you. I, I thought that I had seen it. I just couldn't remember where I put it. So. I fully understand that. <laughs> if you've lost it, I sent out, just so you know, I sent out the documents for each session. Yeah. Um, at the time of the session, it would be the that afternoon after the session. And then yep. I also sent them again with the recording for that session. But if you can't find anything, we have them all and you can ask for anything you're missing. Yeah, that's what I, I have taken those and uh, archived them and we've been using them as we've been working through. I, I just couldn't remember the document. I just we all lose something along the way in this process and that's OK. So feel free to ask if you don't know where it is. Thanks a lot. So can I ask a related absolutely. question? I'm sorry, it'll be quick. So just along with what Dana was saying, I just want to, because I'm probably going to work on this tomorrow for a few hours and I don't want to do it wrong. I've been thinking I would take all of those size, scope, and quality tables and put them all on one Google Doc and then convert it to a PDF and do the same thing with the program analysis tables and put it on a PDF and like just have the PDF like ready to go for each section. That PDF is fine, but what Gwen, you really can just take the completed documents you already have and scan them. You don't have to put them into something else. Right. I guess what I'm saying is they're all like Google Docs, right? The instructors all worked on them. We all worked on them together. Yep. So I was, I was just going to take all of those, put them on one and say final size, scope and quality. And then that would be fine. It. OK, that would be fine. And just have it ready to go for each section. That's perfectly OK. For those of you who teachers may have filled them out on paper with by with pen and pencil, you can scan those. You don't have to type them all up. As long as they're somewhat legible, that's OK, too. Whatever format you got them in, collect them, scan them, upload them. I, it will be OK. I know Bob created um, a spreadsheet. It's very similar to what Gwen is stating. You can and, use that. But also, that's a good way to use that to show your RAB or your school board in a consolidated yeah. matter because it, it shows all programs, if that makes sense. And, and I, I don't think Bob's here today, but he may be willing to share it as well. Bob couldn't be here today, but I am sure that if you reach out to him, he might very well be willing to share it. Ruth, just a quick, I know there's one section that wants advisory board members, minutes of meetings and all of that, just upload it into, is there a separate place for all of that? Or is that part of, I think, I, I think it's the program of study section, include it with the program of study. Ask that again, Melissa. I was trying to think about three places it could be, and then I forgot what I was thinking about where it should be. There's one section, I believe it's program of study, that's asking for a list of current advisory board members, the agendas for the last couple of years, and minutes for the last couple of years. Do you want all of that uploaded in that with the program of study, or is there a separate location for that? That's a great question, and I don't know, but I will find out and let you know. Yeah, I just yeah, want to I mention, I know how I tackled that one, Melissa, and it's probably wrong. I, the size, scope, and quality in that table, I just was linking um, to our website to the archive. But That's I suppose... perfectly okay, Gwen. That's fine. Okay. Um, and Melissa, I'm going to get back to, I'll, I'll send an email to everybody. Doug and I will talk about it because he's the one who has to read those, so I'm going to make sure it works for him. 
I just know we with the Perkins monitoring, I believe we uploaded all of those last year for the previous two years. We did, so you don't probably have to reload. It would probably just be this year that we need to worry about. Okay, if you could let us know that. Okay. I'm going to say definitely now you only have to do this year and then we'll tell you how. Thank you. Are there questions? So this is where we have the active participation in a different way part of the piece of this, and I'm going to stop recording for a moment. I'm going to come back to recording later on, but this is where we're going to stop Bruce, recording just for one now. More thing. Just one more thing before yep. you stop recording. That document that you shared with us that tells what we load into each section, um, you shared with us on, let me just tell you what date, February 8th, if anybody wants to go back through your email. It's an email from Ruth that says additional information from February uh, from Friday CLNA session. Perfect. It's and I will send and that helps me, Nancy. I'll make sure I also find what was sent then and resend that as well. So perfect. Just in case, yeah, just in case if anybody wanted today. If you need it right away, that's where it is. Perfect. Thank you, Nancy. All right, I'm going to stop recording for a moment. 